Hi, I'm Georgia. And I'm Simone. And this episode, we are joined by a fellow fan of books here at Hope, David, as we review One Illumined Thread, the brand new debut novel by Sally Colin James. This, as always, will be a spoiler-free episode, so if you haven't read or finished the book, don't worry about it. You can still keep watching or listening or whatever you're doing. Yeah, welcome to the podcast, uh, David. Now, Thank you. you, as someone I regularly end up chatting with um, over the coffee machine down in the kitchen about books, yep. uh, especially the latest ones we've been reading, and I always walk away from those conversations just humbled by how brilliantly and passionately you communicate like your thoughts on books. So we decided. I decided it was time to stop gatekeeping that, and we would get you on the podcast to get your you. thoughts. Thank you, David. Now you're actually a numbers guy here at it's Hope. True. You're the CFO, um, but you also love art, I which uh, is a huge part of this book as well. Yep. Um, I wish we could say we planned that. Actually, didn't. No. This is like a lucky kind of thing. Yep. Where did your love of books and art begin? Uh, books always. Um, I've loved reading, um, particularly once I finished high school. You know, at high school you're forced to read mm -hmm. novels and then write essays about. Them that wasn't great, but I love spy thrillers, legal thrillers, Scandi noir, particularly <laughs> Japanese contemporary, uh, most genres. But interestingly, I haven't read a lot of historical fiction, so this is kind of a new area for me. I've read a few, but it's so it'll be new uh, around art. Well, we could have a podcast on that. But <laughs> in my mum's home, we had Australian landscapes and other things on the wall, some of which are now in my office. Um, but in 1985, my wife, my now wife, then girlfriend, took me to see the Monet exhibition at the Art Gallery of New South Wales. And, well, it was love at first sight. Is this still your favourite artist? Yes, yes. And then uh, as we've travelled, I've travelled for work and pleasure, I've been able to go to some awesome art galleries around the world and uh, see some amazing paintings and sculptures and that. But that being said, the new wing to the New South Wales Art Gallery is fantastic. So if you haven't been, go. I better stop now because I'm going to get sidetracked on that. <laughs> I love that. All right, without further ado, let's introduce the book, uh, One Illumined Thread, possibly the prettiest cover of a book I've ever seen. Um, it is author Sally Colin James's debut novel. I cannot believe it after I read this, that it's a debut novel. It is fantastic. Uh, she has had a successful corporate career in event management and communications. She decided to return to her first love of creative writing and she gained an actually, uh, she actually gained an Australian postgraduate awards scholarship to complete a PhD in creative writing. Um, and this is her first novel. As I said, it's won multiple awards already. It was shortlisted for the International First Pages Prize and it's only been out for a few months. So very excited. Uh, Simone, what's it about? So uh, it's it's a fascinating book. It sort of follows three different time periods. So the first is in Judea, um, Judea under the brutal rule of King Herod. A woman yearns for a child but is out is outcast when she does not fall pregnant. Against all convention, she masters the art of glass blowing, a creative act she believes will keep her dream of motherhood alive. Mm. And then it sort of flips to the Renaissance era in Florence and there's a young wife who is left penniless by her hopelessly unfaithful husband and struggles to find a way to support herself and her young son. And then in contemporary Australia, a talented textile conservator is devastated by loss and is desperate to re regain control of her life. Each woman wants something different that all seems unattainable um, and it will take all their courage, creativity and determination to achieve it. Oh, it's great. And it's all um, kind of linked together, th I guess, through these threads, one illumined thread, yeah. um, of this beautiful art throughout history. Yeah. Uh, let's get straight into the positives. What did you like mm. or love about this book, David? I really liked uh, the two strong women uh, from Herod's era, um, uh, uh, Elisheva and Antonia in the Renaissance period. Um, they were the three. They were really strong for me um, and what they were trying to achieve. Uh, the third woman, um, Dr. Reed, who apparently has no first name. Elizabeth, right at the end. Oh, okay, there we go. <laughs> uh, but she uh, is making steps. I like the images of the different eras uh, brought alive and it made you feel engaged with the characters and the locations, mm. which was fantastic. I love thinking about Florence and trying to get my head around that, which was great. 
And I really love the challenges for these women in each time period um, for very different reasons in their journey in trying to make mm -hmm. a difference. Um, and also the way they the the way that can uh, the novel conveyed pain and anguish at different stages and ages of the these women. Mm -hmm. So I thought there was a lot of strength in these characters in these women uh, overcoming a whole bunch of stuff which I really liked. Yeah. Yeah, I sort of I also loved the way that she described the places and it really incorporated. Mm. She had like the food, and the language, mm. and the clothing and everything, mm. and I found that kind of ended up both like highlighting the differences but also the similarities at times between the the time periods and the women. Yep. Mm. Um I feel like there there were moments that sort of and, and things that you could see even from all the way through from the King Herod time kind of interwoven and 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 found in all these different time periods right up until now and mm. and the lasting effect that has. Um I did love yeah the strength that these women had um I also loved the way that they were there were moments where they they kept hope while still having anguish. Mm. Um and there was this underlying kind of theme almost of like of hope. It was determination, but determination wrapped up in the hope and the faith that they had mm. in their belief of certain things, whether that be in the belief of the artwork, in the belief of, you know, having a child or in the belief of being able to get out of the situation that you know they're in and I think that for me really resonated I loved that 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 little element of hope kind of throughout the whole thing yeah I, I love that and I, I actually love further um you already touched on it Simone but how well researched this mm. book was it mm. um especially um Alicia's time which we know as Christians um as Elizabeth um, John mm -hmm. the Baptist's mother. So you, you are familiar with a little bit of her story, mm -hmm. I guess, from the Bible. It doesn't necessarily follow exactly what we know and it fleshes out her character in, I think, what is a gorgeous way. I think some sometimes I really struggle with, uh, when I read the Bible, of really putting myself in the time period, in the mm -hmm. shoes of these mm -hmm. women in particular, because you just don't really have any context of what they were going through. So this novel... Um, really kind of and I know it's a work of fiction don't get me wrong but it really kind of put into perspective what kind of struggles they had how similar to really to the struggles mm. that um you know many women continue to have today but also just gave a real kind of humanity to the to the bible stories and the these main yeah. characters in in stories that we've grown up hearing um yeah has, it was really beautiful I thought that really came out in the um scenes where Herod's soldiers came through yes. the village Mm. And the anguish and and yeah. and the relationships then between the women after mm. after uh, those soldiers came through. I thought that was very powerful. It's a side of the, I guess, the story of what happened in the Bible that we don't think about or look mm. at very often. Yes. Mm. The, um, the aftermath, the yes. aftermath, and the 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 people around the situation and what they dealt with. Mm. Um, I don't really like collateral damage isn't quite the right word, but it's sort of that. Well, the aftershocks. The, yeah. 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 And when the narrators move on and yeah. these characters, you know, are, are kind of gone from the verses, you know, they still have yeah. to pick up the life. pieces. They yeah. have life. Yeah. 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 yeah, it's so true. This is a historical novel, a uh, his historical work of fiction. Uh, she has put a lot of research into, especially as we're talking about, you know, Elisha's time period. She uses a lot of the Aramaic and uh, mm. the, the glossary at the back is like 50 pages long yeah. of how, how well this was researched. Yeah. I'm very yeah. impressed. It does cover a few time periods, though, and was interested on your perspective, David. Do you think the book does history justice? A and if it does or doesn't, do does it even matter? Well, that's interesting whether it matters or not. I think I think she does Herod's time and the research around that really well. Um, I think, I mean, obviously the biblical context and knowing those stories so well to, to have that brought out and the society so well um, uh, encapsulated, the relationships I think were really strong. In the Renaissance period, um, I... For me, she captured the hustle and bustle of Florence mm. and Florent and the importance of that city really well. I think the relationships and 
being seen in society and all of that. I mean, that's Florence. It's a beautiful place. And I think she really captured that well. Um, the, the contemporary time, look, Adelaide, Sydney, Melbourne, you know, Auckland, to me, it didn't matter. Yeah. It was yeah. more about the relationship there, not the location. And we're living, we're living contemporary yeah. Australia. Well, it's much of a muchness, I yeah. guess. Yeah. So I think the way she picked up the social mores, uh, of the time were really strong and I think the way she described um, the scenery uh, and what was going on, the action, the places, I thought was excellent and it, I was very much transported. Yeah, I, I one of the things I loved is that she actually at the end does go into and has notes on some of the historical elements and if she made changes, why she mm. made changes. Yes. And I love seeing that. I love seeing that she... You know, any kind of change that deviated from historical context or was slightly, I guess, inaccurate um, was there was a purpose and a reason for it. Kind of like when a book or a, you know, film is adapted, the inaccuracies only matter if they change important moments or context, Mm -hmm. you know. So you can merge things together. You can make these changes if it's something that isn't going to drastically change context, context or like real integral important history, you know, because I mean, also let's be real, like we are constantly having new historical discoveries made that change how we view or think about history already. Mm. Um, and so, you know, th- th- there are changes constantly mattering. So for me, the whole doesn't matter falls into that. There are elements that yes, there are historical moments and historical things that if we don't, if we change it, it can be disrespectful or it can be, you know, it, it's not appropriate. However, for me, I feel like, you know, even if an artist or a writer decides to change that, as long as it's within that context and very clearly this is an alternate universe, this isn't what really happened. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think for this book she was making it what really happened and any changes for me, didn't really matter because they were things that either we cannot possibly know, <laughs> like what happened after Herod went through the town. We can't, we don't, we don't really know um, exactly what happened there. Um, or the second thing of like the changes had a reason and a purpose and it was sort of, you know, small things about like how they might refer to something mm. that in the context didn't matter. What mattered to me though was that the piece of art Yes. that was painted, was real. Yes. And to see yeah. the, I went online, looked at the picture, read a bit about yeah. it. The, the Antonia's husband was a real artist. Yeah. Yeah. He painted this picture and it's a magnificent picture. I spent so much time like Googling yes. names, like especially in the Renaissance era. Did you guys do the same where yes. it was like, you know, there'd be a name mentioned of like one of um her husband's like friends and I'd be like oh is that a real artist and I'd go and like google it and it would actually be even like the nickname that that artist had well that's the thing I love yeah. that they started they're like oh yeah Michelle this Michelle that I'm like I think you're talking about Michelangelo, Michelangelo right, right now yeah, yeah. <laughs> what yeah. like were you just like on nickname basis yeah. with this guy and, <laughs> and Raphael and Leonardo <laughs> it was just it was very natural yeah the way they were referring to their friends yet com- almost competitors <laughs> And what they thought about them. And I thought that was a nice touch. Again, it made it more yeah. real. Yeah. 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 I think that was completely down to the author's research and attention to detail mm. in those moments. Mm. Really well yeah, done. Very much so. Leading on from that, I think it's it was important to remember that, yes, it's a historical fiction. It mm. never claimed to be um, a historical piece. But I think knowing that the author would know, especially in, the, in Herod's time, how many people would be aware of these characters and not only aware of them uh, as Christians really really important and Mm. dear to not only you know dear to our hearts but you know create (laughs) part of the faith that you know underlies our foundation so I think she uh really has respected it and kind of upheld all the characters and that time with real dignity so I really appreciated that Mm. uh leading on from that as we have touched on um it does go through three different timelines and obviously tenuously linked by this art. How do you feel the three stories worked across the timeline? Look, I thought the earlier story connected well with the middle story. Mm-hmm. I thought the the story of um, uh, Elizabeth 
uh, Elisheva and Antonia with the picture and Antonia's obsession with the painting and mm. wondering about Elizabeth and all of that I thought was great. I thought there was a really strong connection. What I didn't get was where the tapestry really fitted. I mean, yeah. I know it was a tapestry of the painting and it was found in a uh, in a barn somewhere <laughs> rolled up in, you know, but... What, where did the tapestry come from? I thought, oh, maybe we were going, when we first heard about it, I thought, oh, maybe um, Antonia was going to be the star of the tapestry, but, which was, oh. but I, it just, that didn't link well for me, although yeah. obviously it was a tapestry of the painting yeah. and the restoration was important, but I thought I found that link with the contemporary story a bit too tenuous. It felt a little manufactured for mm -hmm. me because it wasn't clear and I just felt that that Adelaide part of the story didn't really connect back with the other two. And the other two, of course, took up most of the book. Well, that was my thing as well. We knew so little about Dr. Reed, really. And mm. she wasn't, I think there was like four chapters, maybe five. And mm. I just wanted to know more about her. And I think you're right. The tenuous links, it's like, yes, it was fine, but it wasn't as strong. And I think it's mm. just because I don't know if the book needed to be longer. I don't know if you need to cut the contemporary part altogether. I don't know. I. What do you think, Simone? For me, I wanted more definitely of the contemporary. I do feel like there's an element of almost like her story being juxtaposed against the other two stories. There were so many links and you saw like these women who, you know, supported each other and these, you know, creating together. And then you saw like, like Dr. Elizabeth's story where she, had come so far from that. She was mm. trying to do everything on her own. Mm. So for me, it felt like almost like a, a showing the the juxtaposition of, you know, where almost like showing where have we gone wrong on this? Where have we gotten to a point where, you know, we're not creating together, where we're, we're not, where we've lost something of those interactions and relationships and moments. And I think it does end up bringing that out and it shows that if you do, you know, open yourself up to that, it's there. But I think there's, for me, it was the juxtaposition that I enjoyed. I think on that as well, I feel like we can just insert ourselves mm -hmm. into Dr. Reed's story. She wow. almost served as a placeholder to the modern women, the mm -hmm. modern woman, us today. Yeah. How do we relate to Ella Shiva? How do we relate to Antonia? How do all these women yeah. kind of relate throughout history? So... In saying that, yes, I wanted more of her story, but it, I wouldn't say hers was the most important because we can relate. Yes. You, you picked up that the word juxtaposition is really interesting there because even though uh, Antonia and Ella Shiva's husbands uh, uh, could have been worse for, like, treated them badly, mm. they didn't. Like, they, they weren't abused yet. Dr. Reed had the worst husband of them all, mm -hmm. yep. actually. And the greatest loss, yeah, which came across very early in the book, yeah. and was made me very sad actually. Mm -hmm. And um, so, her story, uh, while she could have a modern woman who can have it all, that terrible expression that's used, she had nothing because mm, yeah. what she'd had, she'd lost. I, th I think there's that strength and resilience thing coming back through again, isn't it? Of like her as she worked on this tapestry like Antonia did with the photo, the, with the painting, mm. drew strength from the original story um, and drew strength to kind of do what she was doing and what she needed to do. And that for me was a bit of the link, but you're right. Like I do think there was, it was a very tenuous link. Mm. It wasn't, it wasn't as linked as the first two. Mm. Um could it have been linked better? Yes, absolutely. But I did enjoy kind of seeing how even in her story, there were little clues left as to mm. how everything did all link together. This book focuses heavily on family dynamics. Um, not only, you know, husband and wife, uh, mother and daughter, uh, the various relationships that exist within that, including the societal expectations of those roles and how mm. they've changed or maybe not changed much throughout the 2,000 years of history that this book covers. 
what stood out the most to you in terms of um, a societal dynamic or relationship? Oh, well, the mother-daughter relationships just <laughs> leapt out of the book and punched you in the face, really. <laughs> it was so strong. The expectations of society, of women and their roles and their culture, uh, and, and then pushing against it, even to the contemporary story. In the early two stories, well, you would expect that because we know that men were, you know, the dominant, still are, unfortunately, too many times, um, and women, you know, were expected and it was, you know, to, to have this subservient role. Um, but And the mothers um, sort of made the, their daughters feel guilty mm. if they weren't bearing enough children, and particularly Elisheva's mother, who was very nasty, yet there was re- sort of reconciliation in in that as well. I, I know there's a lot to unpack there, um, but I think that was that was that. And these two women who pushed against their societal values and accepted the consequence of that. Yeah, I think particularly Elisheva, the role of the men in their lives and the good and the bad of that husbands, fathers. Um, there's pretty confronting stuff there, and I think. For me, the frustration still that women are made victims and given blame when they aren't and shouldn't be. Mm. And it still happens now and that oh, it's just it really hurts me. And and I think she didn't uh, one thing I liked, she didn't make any bones about that in, mm. in the way she wrote about it. She presented it, she just put it out there. And, you know, we have to confront that as the reader. And I thought that was very good, actually. But, uh, yeah, I think, again, it's just societal values are touched on that. Has it changed much? In some ways, heaps. In other ways, mm. Yes, so I, yeah, I agree. I think it was amazingly done with that. I also feel like the mother-daughter thing, I've got to admit, like, yeah, totally (laughs) that that hit. Um, I think especially, look, I'll be honest, and my mum has said this, she struggled to let go when I kind of got older and so there was that back and forth a little bit and there's definitely, I think you can see where the mothers are coming from. Like it's it's often still coming from a good place but like you said, sitting in that, 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 what they've experienced or what the society is to them and that fear for their daughters. It, it comes so much down to that fear. The thing I loved um, very much, in especially the King Herod time, was the men in, that, in those scenarios, the father's relationship with... Um, yeah, with Elisheva. With Elisheva yeah. was incredible, yeah. her relationship with her husband, mm. Her brother was also amazing. Yeah, the, the young brother, yeah. The young yeah. brother. Like there were so many wonderful, wonderful men in that. Um, and then again, like even in for Antonio, she still had men who who stepped up and became a, a positive in her world. And and I guess, you know, again, that societal thing of that context of the time, you know, we might look at it now and go, oh, that's not great. But for that time and that era, it was amazing yeah they're actually doing they're actually doing incredible like for her and with her and then like you said yeah then the current time and it's almost like a step backwards Mm. um and just that that feeling of um bringing all those relationships out um but for me the biggest one uh the biggest relationship thing that I loved in there was the elder women who or the or the friendship women who would step into that role when their mothers couldn't for whatever reason, whether it's difficult relationships, whether that was, you know, their mother had died, all of those things. So like El Shiva with um, Miriam, mm-hmm. um, with, you know, you got Lucia with um, Antonia. Antonia and then Tris with, um, yeah, Elizabeth. And for me that was that was really impactful because I don't have children, but I have been that person that stepped in with friends' kids at times when they've needed an extra person to talk to. Or, And I think that's so important in relationships because mother-daughter relationships are difficult and they can be difficult. And so sometimes just having other women around, women that you know and you love and you trust to be able to be part of your community. Yeah, it's just that that sense of sisterhood it doesn't need to be blood it's yeah and i i love that that was carried throughout the 2000 years and it's just like nothing's changed <laughs> i thought the women in the church um when uh, were also even though they were 
sort of prim and proper, but there was a connection there mm -hmm. within the walls of the church, which it was, was so important. It was almost like a shared understanding mm. of whether oh. that's struggle, societal expectation. Mm. They know there is. There's a yeah. shared understanding that just you know isn't possible mm. between the, the men and the women which i i really liked all right to wrap this up did you have a favorite character a favorite line or a moment and why antonia's friend eugenio i really liked him um he, their friendship was my favorite and when they went to the ball and they got all dressed up <laughs> so fun it was great it was just lovely his care for her his friendship over time um mm. though he suffers of course for for that and at the hands of others i thought that relationship was very real, the whole part of it. I really liked that, unexpectedly, because he was only a quite a minor character, but a really important one. I have two quotes that I really love that I think for me kind of summed up how I felt at the end of the book, and that is, um, when did women forget the power of creating together? And why isn't this their shared joy painted more often mm. and instead of the suffering instead yeah. of the suffering and I think that was you know in reference to you know who we now know as like Elizabeth and Mary like the um the visitation the visitation mm -hmm. and in particular I think those characters are consistently um portrayed the suffering is often shown but the shared joy mm. um is so rarely shown and I think that's that's been the case through through all of history for women and when we create together the power in that. I love that. And my actually favorite quote kind of um, goes off on that. Um, Cause obviously the, the link between all these three women is art. You've got Ella Shiva with her glass blowing yeah. and um, Antonia with obviously her husband and is a painter and she's the, the color yeah. mixer trying yeah. to make this perfect white paint. And then you've got um, Elizabeth as the conservator. Um, but this particular one comes from Ella Shiva. Uh, she says, as I roll the molten gather, gather over the slab, I see my work as a prayer. Others disagree, disdainful, sceptical at a work that does not produce a vessel for a function like a mm. goblet or a plate. But if a thing is produced with the limbs and fingers Rabon Alma has made, that's their word for God, then why can't a thing of beauty also be a thing of God? Mm. And I think that was just so powerful to me because Simone and I were actually talking just this week about uh, jobs and how your job doesn't have to be your whole purpose. And sometimes even in modern society, if, you're, if your job isn't your purpose and your life, it almost creates this like existential crisis. Um, but I think just having something be beautiful and enjoying something and being passionate about something for the sake of it, uh, isn't that a thing of God? Because God created mm. everything. I found that, yeah, really beautiful. Mm. All right, I think that comes pretty much to the end of the episode. David Barker, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you us. for having me. It's been a pleasure to be with you and chat about this book. And we would love for you to be a part of our community as well. If this is your first time listening, you can join the Hope Book Club Facebook group for more conversation and also to find out what book we'll be reviewing next month. We would also love this podcast to reach more people. And the way you can help with that is to rate, review, subscribe to our podcast, uh, and also share it with some bookish friends. Just send over a link to someone you think might love it. And who knows, uh, could absolutely make their day. Until then, stay reading and we'll catch you next time. Sim, I believe you have a quote to end on. Yeah, so from American novelist, William Styron, a great book should leave you with many experiences and slightly exhausted at the end. You live several lives while reading. I think that it's sums good. up this book. It did for me. <laughs>